Hello, I'm Angus Scott and welcome to The Debrief. If you are here for the first time, welcome. If you're returning after you liked what you heard last week, then that's even better. On The Debrief, we discuss the major sports stories that are dominating your conversations. Liverpool fans, there's plenty for you this week. And in the middle of that debate, we'll also welcome the transfer guru Fabrizio Romano. Fab will be dropping in every week to give us his take on the market like only he can. And you can access the Football Debrief via Fabrizio's Substack, if you haven't already done so, and all your usual podcast outlets. Coming up today, Fab has the latest on Turam and Lavia and whether they are heading to Anfield and who's likely to be going in the opposite direction and leaving Liverpool. Sitting alongside me each week is Ben Jacobs. Ben, like Fabrizio, has more eyes and ears than a nosy neighbour when it comes to transfers. Hi, Ben. How are you doing? Busy yeah, times. More, it, well, it's crazy time for the likes of you and Fab. This is this is bonkers time of the year. Um, so we are very blessed on the debrief at having two journalists with a direct route to the inside track on rumours and fact in the transfer world. And this week, we are asking the question: How will Liverpool bounce back from such a relatively poor season? So it's our great pleasure to welcome Jason McAteer to the show. Now, Jason spent four years at Anfield earned over 50 caps for the Republic of Ireland during Jack Chelton's glory years. And we've dragged you off the golf, golf course, Jason. Yeah, uh, it's been a mixed morning because of the rain. So I, I went out and had nine holes, which I shouldn't confess to because I'm not a member anymore of the golf course that I live on. So <laughs> I'll probably get fined did, after them seeing this on the did, podcast. But yeah, did, uh, nip, did, did you sneak on at seven and, and dropped off at 16 or something? Is it one of those courses you can stink on halfway through? Yeah, I live on the fourth. So I just <laughs> literally go through my gate. <laughs> Jump on the fourth, play nine holes, stay away from the clubhouse so I don't get spotted, and then walk home. Yeah, so uh, a very cheap way of doing it. Can't take the scouser out of me, mate. That's what no, it is. No, exactly. Once a scouser, always a scouser. Well, we're also delighted to be joined by sports editor of Dubai Eye, journalist Chris McCarty. He's also here. Chris front also fronted the Robbie Fowler podcast with the great man himself. Chris, it's great to have you here. Uh, you're enjoying the heat of Dubai at the moment. Uh, up to uh, about 50 I'm, degrees, yeah? Yeah, just about that, Angus. It's going to be a long <laughs> summer, I think. But it's great to be on the podcast. Looking forward to discussing all things Liverpool Football Club. Jason, I've spent a bit of time with Jason. He knows I'm no Liverpool fan but i think they're in for a good season i know we're going to get to it it's going to be a great season for them ahead i think yeah, yeah can, Angus, can i ask chris a question i'm a little bit yeah, disappointed chris knowing that we do have a very good relationship and we've worked together quite a number of times why robbie and not me <laughs> that is a good question you know why jace because you're a busy boy uh, at the time <laughs> robbie was stuck in india he was a manager over in the indian super league and he just had more spare time than you do you're on the golf course he was stuck in a hotel <laughs> <laughs> right, I'll let you off. Good answer. It's a very good answer. Anyway, Jason, let, let, let's talk about uh, Liverpool. Not the ideal season for Liverpool last season. What do you make of the summer transfer dealings? Um, yeah, well, there, there was obviously rumblings, wasn't it, towards sort of the back end of the season, um, you know, mainly down to Liverpool's performances and where they were languishing in the, in the Premier League and you know, how bad the season had gone about, obviously, surgery needed doing in certain areas. So the transfer talk for Liverpool has been ongoing now for, for a good number of months. And I think all eyes have been on who we're going to bring in and how we're going to bring players in. <laughs> um, because obviously FSG are, are taking a, a lot of criticism at the minute. Um, so Jude Bellingham right at the beginning was was obviously the preferred target, I think, by by Liverpool fans. Um, you know, he'd had a very, very good World Cup and sort of wet everyone's appetite. And from what I was, I was hearing, you know, there was a, there was an interest from both parties. So obviously, the appetite, you know, grew and grew, and we expected someone like you to to be coming to the football club at the end of the season. But quite quickly, I think as his performances were, were or as he was growing in stock, really by his performances from Bruce Dortmund, and then obviously off the back of a good World Cup it would become more and more apparent that we weren't going to get him. It was just going to be too expensive. And, and fair play to Liverpool. They ruled themselves out pretty quickly and, and calmed everyone down. Um, and then, obviously, all eyes you know, went on, a, on different players and, and different ideas, to be honest. What I will say is the criticism of, of FSG, I think it's sometimes unwarranted because we, 
I think every football club is struggling to hang on to Manchester City's coattails at the minute. I mean, I know they've got 115 accusations aimed at them for financial fair play, and I'm sure it will get sorted out. But I think for everyone, Angus, uh, and I don't know if the lads agree with me, it, it's something that needs clearing up very, very quickly because this football club is, is, is just going to stretch away. And the likes of Liverpool and the likes of Tottenham, I think Arsenal, they're going to get exhausted by trying to hang on in the transfer market by spending inflated prices that are getting ramped up by the likes of Manchester City. And we're finding it increasingly difficult to spend that kind of money to be able to compete with this team. So we have to do it a different way. And for me, City have become a different animal in the last three or four months. And again, we've seen their power. They tried to nick Declan Rice, you know, throwing a, an audacious bid in for him. Um, obviously, it wasn't successful, but that's the market that they're in. And how are we supposed to compete with that? Uh, how, ca- how can we have one of the top four then, uh, Ben, and you, Chris? How can you have one of the top four that can't even compete with the, with the top one? I mean, there is no even playing field there, even for any competition then, if that is the case. If, as Jason is saying, they've got to do it differently, why should they have to do it differently? Well, I think structurally and in terms of spending power, that's true. But ultimately, we mustn't forget that historically, Liverpool have gone blow to blow with Manchester City in previous seasons, except for last season. So for me, it's two separate points. One is how do Liverpool bounce back from last season? And is that a blip or is it a sign that they need a complete revamp? And in areas particularly like midfield, has that been delayed through various reasons to the point where they've fallen behind with the players that they've got? And the second point is how do you compete with Manchester City in the long term? And I think that Jason outlines very correctly that it requires entering into an inflated market, which is something that isn't conducive with Liverpool's model. So I don't think we can only say, poor Liverpool, they've never spent a penny, FSG or no City football group, because that's not accurate when you actually add up the transfer fees that Jurgen Klopp has been able to spend. But ultimately, Liverpool look for value and their model is therefore different to Manchester City and very different to Chelsea as well, who have obviously spent £600 million over the course of the last two windows. And as a consequence, if Liverpool don't see value in not only transfer fee, but structure of a deal and wages and agent fees, then they walk away, as was the case with Jude Bellingham, and they use that budget for other players. And I think that everybody criticised Liverpool at the time when they walked away from Jude Bellingham because, as Jason says, it appeared like the player perhaps wanted Liverpool and fans consequently put two and two together and say Liverpool are the front runners. And even we as journalists report that at times. But the reality is they've taken that budget, I think anyway, Chris, and they've spent it wisely. Alexis McAllister, only £35 million. That might be the bargain of the summer. Soboslai is a bit more money, but Liverpool felt like they had to trigger that release clause. So, Over time, we'll find out whether that transfer fee is an investment or an expense. And then if they bring in one more midfielder, likely a defensive midfielder, suddenly the midfield revamp will be done. And things, Chris, I think anyway, will be a whole lot rosier and we'll be saying once again that Liverpool were shrewd and Liverpool's model actually, even though you have to be quite patient with it, tends to always pay off. Yeah, absolutely, Ben. I completely agree with every point you've made there. You look at the ages of the two boys they're bringing in as well. Zobos Laya, just 22. Alexis McAllister, Premier League ready, 24 years of age. He doesn't turn 25, I think, until the end of the year. Two real good ages, two footballers who I think fit seamlessly into a Jurgen Klopp side. And I think more than that, I think the interesting aspect for Liverpool moving into this new season Cody Gakpo has got six months under his belt. I think he's a wonderful player. I I think you're going to see Cody Gakpo in a whole new light this coming campaign. And he's only 23, you're right, as well. You know, looking to these younger players, Chris, yeah. Exactly. 
by Angus. I think you see him now as a, a false nine in that Bobby Firmino role. Darwin Nunes, I think, will be a far better player for his 12 months in the Premier League. And again, he's at a real good age. And then throw in two fellas who were on the books at Liverpool but had their injury interrupted campaigns. Luis Diaz, who's just been handed the number seven shirt. And then you look at Diego Jota, who I'm a huge fan of. You look at his stats. He comes up with big goals at big times, does Jota. And then Mo Salah remains on the books. So, yeah, I think I'm, again, quietly saying this. I'm not a Liverpool fan, as Jace knows, and as you're aware as well, Ben. But I think with another couple of acquisitions, I still think defensively, you know, if Trent Alexander-Arnold's pushing forward, maybe another right back, Calvin Ramsey, the young Scot, I know has gone on loan to Brett Preston North End for next season. There's maybe defensive kind of frailties that they might need to remedy this summer still. But further up the field, and with McAllister and Sobis Lai added to that midfield, I think Liverpool will emerge as Man City's big kind of rivals yet again this campaign. What is it? Form is temporary, class is permanent. Jurgen Klopp still the right man for that job. And quietly, I think Liverpool will be optimistic of a good campaign upcoming. OK, yeah, disappointing, obviously, last season. We'll, get, we'll hear from Fab in just a moment. I'm going to go to him in a minute. But, but Jason, just before we do, do you okay. feel it's just little tweaks that are needed? You know, shouldn't be throwing the baby out with the bathwater just because they they had a one disappointing season and ended up fifth in the Premier League. So so tweaks rather than the big overhaul. Yeah, not not a lot will change to be honest. The way the way we play, I know we, we see Trent in it in a different role, and it obviously suited Liverpool towards the end of the season. They went on a really good run, which is obviously gives us a lot of optimism going into this season. Plus, with the uh, with the new signings and hopefully with more to come. Yeah, I mean. You know, it is, there is a lot of optimism around, but everybody's getting better, aren't they? And there's no guarantee. You know, we we talk about signings. McAllister, yeah, I agree. You know, he's he's had an experience of the Premier League, but he's still coming to a football club that plays slightly different to, to what Brighton do. Um, so is he going to fit in? Is he going to hit the ground running? That Well, that remains to be seen. So, yeah, I mean, Jurgen Klopp is the big factor for me. You know, just keeping him at, at the club. You know, the fact that it's it's renewed optimism, isn't it? We go in fresh start. He gets a full pre-season under his belt. It's not a disrupted season. And to be honest, you know, over the last three or four seasons, there's been a lot of disruption through the Premier League campaign. We've had a World Cup, you know, in, in the middle of last season. Then we've gone through the COVID years, recuperating from that. Um, so this is where we get a full run at it. And yeah, there is a lot of optimism. But, you know, we do have to sort of tread tentatively because... I do think Manchester City are stretching away and I would like to th- see things cleared up so we do get a more level playing field no. uh, when it comes to the actual football. Well, as we've said, Liverpool have been busy in the transfer market already, bringing in key targets, uh, McAllister, Zobersly. Uh, there are other names who we expect to arrive at Anfield in the near future and, as ever, the transfer guru Fabrizio Romano joins us to give us the inside track on the big transfer news. Fabrizio, thanks for dropping in as ever. Now, we've been discussing just a couple of Liverpool targets. Their first one, World Cup winner Alexis McAllister, arrived for just £35 million. Now, how come that deal was so cheap? Yeah, there was uh, a clause into the contract. It was not a proper clause, but it was kind of agreement between Alexis McAllister and Brighton when he signed the new deal uh, at Brighton he had that kind of exit clause again it was not a proper one that you go and trigger as the Dominic Shobosley one it was a traditional release clause this one was a bit different was kind of uh, agreement between parties to letting go for that fee and I think Liverpool have been perfect in the strategy not to leak anything about that for a long time so uh, when I received many questions about McAllister I always say it's not going to be 60 65 million pounds as we saw many reports about that kind of fee it was going to be way less than than this, and they've been perfect in the in the strategy. So this is why they were able to sign Alexis McAllister because this was this private agreement between the player and the club, and so they had the green light at the end of May to proceed and sign McAllister. Well, that's a hell of a deal. And and how did the Dominic Zobrzlai deal come about as well? Yeah, this was very fast, honestly. He's always been in the radar at Liverpool from the scouting department and also Jurgen Klopp has always been a big fan of the player, his typical player for his idea. And so they always discussed internally the name of Dominic Soboslai, but we know very well that they had many other options. So the decision to go for Soboslai was at the beginning of last week. They discussed internally and they decided to try uh, to test the water at Leipzig to understand if there was maybe room to negotiate around the release close. And it was not possible because when they started the meetings on player side, the reaction of the player was immediately 
immediately very positive. So he wanted to join Liverpool. He was super excited about this possibility to move to the Premier League and to join uh, to join Liverpool and Jurgen Klopp, who is a big fan of him. So the connection was uh, was very good. But then it was not possible to negotiate with Leipzig. They tried also on Friday in the morning before triggering the release clause in the evening to offer Leipzig something around 60 million euros plus five or 10 in add-ons. So discussing the structure of the add-ons, but for Leipzig was absolutely impossible. It was uh, Leipzig calling Liverpool and telling them no way to negotiate. If you want the player, you have to trigger the release clause. Otherwise, Soboslai is staying there and you can trigger the clause for January because the clause from the 1st of July was only valid for January transfer window. So this is why Liverpool decided to trigger the close on Friday evening and to proceed with Dominic Soboslai, who is considered the top midfielder. And so they're very happy with this side. Well, they must be very happy that they've got two very decent midfielders into their squad. Now, there's talk of a third midfielder. Now, is that likely? And are the likes of Turan, maybe Lavia, uh, possibilities to be the third names at Anfield? Yeah, they want one more. Uh, we have to understand, of course, how they can handle with the financial situation because it's true that they lost Milner, Navi Keita, uh, Oxley, Chamberlain, but it's also true that you have to find the balance when you sign players. And so for Liverpool, this is always crucial. But they will discuss internally this week about Kefren Turam, for sure. He's always been in the list and he remains in the list. So he's a player they really appreciate, but he's very expensive. And also it's important to mention that Romeo Lavia is expensive too because Southampton want around £50 million pounds for Romeo Lavia, but from what I'm hearing, Liverpool in the recent days had some direct contacts on both club and player side to explore the conditions of the Romeo Lavia deal. It's not time for a bid yet, uh, because of course they just completed a deal for Dominic Soboslai, so now it's more time to have internal discussions before attacking any situation for the new midfielder, but they are well informed on Romeo Lavia. They know that also Arsenal are there, but for Arsenal it depends on Thomas Partey. Uh, they are working on this potential exit of Partey, but it's not that easy. Arsenal will let Partey go in case they receive a a good proposal. He's not a player they want to sell for normal or cheap fee. So this is an important point. For Chelsea, they have Joe Shields, who is one of the directors who had Romeo Lavia at Southampton and, of course, at Manchester City. So the connection is very good. But at the same time, Chelsea are busy with Moises Caicedo. And so this is why Liverpool feel that this could be a race with Arsenal and Romeo Lavia is one of the players they have in the list for sure. OK, so, so that's two plus one, maybe. So that's three um, midfielders. Will Liverpool sign a defender? The idea is to go for a defender too. Yes, so they are exploring the defenders' market. Uh, again, let's see about the financial situation because I know Liverpool fans heard in the past about new signings incoming and then sometimes it didn't happen because the strategy can change during the summer. And also for Liverpool, for kind of strategy they have, a Jurgen Klopp especially, it's important to find the right player. So they invest and they go for the players when they are 100% convinced and not just because uh, they want to add one more player in that position. So for Liverpool, it's crucial to understand if there is the right centre-back on the market. And in that case, to try to attack the situation. For example, in January, they were asking for the conditions of the deal for Josko Gbardiol, who is a player who is really appreciated at Liverpool, but was way too expensive. So they immediately decided not to open, not even an official or concrete negotiation with Leipzig. But this shows how they want the right player in the right position. So this is why a new defender is a possibility. Uh, they want a left-footed defender. This is the priority of Liverpool. But again, let's see with the new midfielder, with the new centre-back, how much they would spend on the, on the market, because the financial situation is always crucial there. Uh, absolutely. You, you've, we've got some big names and big expenditure of, of players who have and also may come in. Who's going then? What, what outgoings can we expect from, from Liverpool then? Yeah, I think they already lost many players on the free, uh, as we mentioned. This is why they decided to go big, especially in the midfield. Uh, so this is, was the, the priority of the club. We have to understand what's going to happen with Phillips because he's attracting interest from many clubs. And so this could be a possibility also for him to, to go this summer. Let's see what happens on the contract side for Joel Matip. He's an important player at Liverpool. From what I heard, they had some conversation uh, with uh, Matip on New Deal, but it's not something completed yet. So we have to see also Matip uh, what's going to happen. And then I don't think I don't think we're going to see so many outgoings. I think for Liverpool it's crucial to replace the players they lost and then to complete the squad as soon as possible because Klopp really wants everything done by the end of July. It's not always easy. All the managers dream of the squad to be ready by the end of July. Then it's not always possible. It's not. We know Roberto Firmino is going. Is that deal to Al Ahly sorted now? Is it done? For Firmino, you mean? Correct. Yes. 
Yeah. Not is not completed yet in terms of medical test and contract signing. You know and that after the Akim Ziyech story, we have to be careful until the end, of course, with this kind of, of deals. But it's very advanced. He has an agreement, a verbal agreement with Al Ahli. It's a three year contract, so everything is in place between Firmino and uh, and the club. Just waiting for him to undergo the medical test and then to sign the contract, to check the contracts with his lawyers and then sign. So these are the final steps of this story. But the agreement is uh, is there, and I think there is a ninety percent possibility to see Firmino in Saudi at this point. Okay, away from Liverpool, let's look at some of the other deals that are they're hanging around at the moment. Uh, Jurian Timber, is is that likely to go through for Arsenal fans, perhaps today? Yeah, I think it's very likely. I'm not sure it's going to be today, but it's very likely. Uh, from what I'm hearing, the agreement is closed. It's not done yet. So they're still discussing on some points of the deal. It means the payment terms, again, as for the Clan Rice, but also something else in the terms of how to structure the add-ons. So they're still in discussion, Ajax and uh, Arsenal. Of course, the feeling is for the deal to be completed. So the expectation is this week to get it done and then to have the medical and complete the formal process to see Jordan Timber in an Arsenal shirt. But it's very advanced. It's not done yet, but it's very advanced. Let me clarify that Timber only wanted Arsenal and only wants Arsenal. So he's really desperate to join Arsenal. He's convinced this is the perfect project for, uh, for him and for his future. Now, what about David De Gea at uh, Manchester United? Um, you know, he's, he's out of contract, just got married. He's, he, where's he going? Is he staying? And he is have a of the man to come in for him? Yeah. Yeah. He will have a conversation with, with Manchester United. It will happen this week. Uh, from a United, they say that they didn't want to create any problem to David De Gea, of course, in an important weekend for his private life. So this is why nothing happened a few days ago. But this week, there will be conversations between May United and De Gea. I'm sure that Manchester United will also speak again to Inter for Andre Onana because there is a concrete conversation, but not an official bid yet for Onana. So let's see how this conversation between Inter and May United will go. Uh, also, they have other options for, uh, for a new goalkeeper. So it's not only Onana or De Gea. They have other possibilities. Uh, and another option could be to sign another goalkeeper and to keep De Gea. So to create more competition with a second goalkeeper, with a backup goalkeeper, and then keeping De Gea as first goalkeeper. So there are many options, but it will depend on the conversations they will have this week. Again, there are still no official bid. It's true also the final uh, goalkeeper below is a goalkeeper they are following. But at the moment, still nothing decided. I think the conversation with De Gea will be crucial to understand if he's going to stay as goalkeeper and then they sign a second, the backup, or if they go big on a top goalkeeper like Andre Onana. And you mentioned us a little bit, bit earlier uh, about Caicedo. Are Chelsea the only uh, club that's in for Caicedo? And what sort of price would we be looking at for him? Yeah, at the moment, yes. At the moment, it's only Chelsea. Uh, we heard many rumours about May United, Arsenal, but from what I'm hearing, this summer, the only club really serious on the Caicedo situation is Chelsea. They have an agreement almost ready on the personal terms, not yet agreed between clubs, but Brighton and Chelsea are in direct conversations for Moises, for Moises Caicedo. So this week is going to be important to understand about the price tag. It's still not 100% clear. We know that Brighton are always tough in negotiation. They are not a normal club. So it's not always easy to go there and put the money and you sign the player. You always need some time and some negotiation. Chelsea Chelsea hope to get the deal done around 70, 80 million pounds, but this is not guaranteed yet with Brighton. So this conversation, club to club, direct conversation will help Chelsea to understand how much is needed to sign Caicedo. Also, it's important to mention that the player in February, when we signed the new deal at Brighton, he got some guarantees from Roberto De Zerbi to be allowed to leave the club in the summer because he really wanted that move to Arsenal in January. And now with Chelsea, everything is really close on player side, not yet between clubs. Fab, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for dropping in. We will look forward to seeing you next Monday on The Debrief. Thank you and see you soon. Thank you. My pleasure. Ciao. So, Ben, from what Fabrizio says, you know, clearly two different sorts of midfielders have arrived, but a third is likely as well. Very likely, indeed. I expect Liverpool to push this week to explore, in particular, Romeo Lavia at Southampton. There's a few clubs interested, and you'd think that there'd be a cut price deal available there because of Southampton's relegation. But the reality is, they want around fifty million pounds, and Liverpool are more using a yardstick of forty million, which is actually the buyback clause number although that's only available to Manchester City in 2024. So we know that once a player is around 30 to upwards of 45 million, Liverpool see that as value. As soon as it goes over 50 million, they perhaps turn their attention to other targets, especially given the outlay on Sobersly. So Kefren Thuram is another one to keep an eye on. And Liverpool have also looked over the course of the summer at 
Kone as well, another player that has been on their shortlist. So we know that three midfielders is a possibility. And now that they've brought in two, they'll turn their attention to a modern defensive midfielder, somebody that can play in that number six role. And this tells you that midfield is the big priority. We should also point out that Liverpool had looked at Mason Mount before he joined Manchester United as well. Again, another player that they thought might be possible at 40 to 45 million. But as soon as it became apparent that Chelsea were originally asking for 70 million Liverpool walked away and this is again evidence of how the model works it isn't only about need and desire they're very disciplined as far as valuations are concerned so midfield will be the priority but as Fabrizio said don't rule out a defender coming in as well and then there may be a couple of outgoings too and from there, Liverpool should have the spine to ultimately get back in the top four. And although, Jason, I agree with the point about Manchester City, I suppose my question to you, even if it's maybe a bit pessimistic, is should Liverpool be thinking about challenging with Manchester City, given the season they've come off? Or is this coming season more just about consolidation, which means that fourth place, however you get it, will be good enough for now and then you have to build from there but to get back to Manchester City do Liverpool not need two seasons? To be honest Ben from a from a football point of view you know there's there's two different answers there there's from a, a business point of view which is from the business side of things is how much did they spend how much do they think they need to spend to get back to catching Manchester City from a football point of view it's that's every season when you're at Liverpool Football Club. You know, it, it's about winning the Premier League. It's about winning the league. That That's how you talk at Liverpool. There is no talk of just getting back into the Champions League places. You know, you, you judge that as the season goes on. You know, if you sit in mid-table with 15 games to go like they were last season, or not quite mid-table, but a little bit further up, but then it's obviously they've got to reach the, the Premier League. But as you start the season with Liverpool Football Club, the success is winning the Premier League. And as you said before, you know, they have done it. They have gone up against Manchester City. But for me, it always feels short term. You know, I, I, for the long term point of view, that's the business model side of things. How do you sustain it? How do you keep up with them? For Liverpool, there's always that element of recruitment. There is a slight bit of luck where you're hoping that they hit the ground running and everything goes smoothly and they're in the team playing well and everything clicks and we get off to a good start. You know, when you look at Manchester City, the players that they go for, there are more of a finished article. They do know more, of, like a Declan Rice, for instance, that would just slot in seamlessly, it would seem, to a Manchester City team if he was to go there. And obviously, he's not, but they're the kind of players that they're in the market for. And you just feel like, you know, the players that they recruit just hit the ground running they, for some reason, because maybe for the price tag, maybe that's what they buy. But for Liverpool, they do need that element to look. But, you know, 10 games in, I'm sure Liverpool will will be there. I, I think it's, there's a fresher outlook. You know, there are players that have left the football club. Surgery has been done in that area. You know, there's a you feel there's a youthfulness about the midfield now. In that forward area, we've got lots of different options. I think Jürgen's opened his door up to, to different ways of playing. You know, we went 4-3-3. We were the best at it, best pressing team. But teams find get found out, don't they? You know, as as you know, you might be the best at it, but teams are able to to combat that over the seasons. And I think that was a part of Liverpool's problem last season. People knew how to play against them and and sort of combated that. So Liverpool had to change their ideas. I think Jurgen Klopp now has added strings to the bow where he can play different systems and different personnel in different positions. So, yeah, I, I thoroughly expect Liverpool to have a very, very good season. But Manchester City, for me, are still the team to beat. And... I, I still see him as a very, very strong outfit. Chris, are you watching Liverpool last year? You uh, appreciate how, how the little adjustments had to be made. And do you see these players coming in now to play in the archetypical way that Klopp wants to play them? Or does it give them the flexibility to play slightly differently? I think to, to Jason's point there, Angus, I think it's the flexibility, you know, the archetypal kind of Liverpool way, the, the kind of heavy metal football, uh, as Jürgen has referenced himself. I'm not sure Alexis McAllister and Solbuslai are that way. You know, they're not necessarily high energy, pressing high up the pitch. I think we might see this Liverpool team evolve into a kind of different Liverpool that we perhaps have been used to in the Jürgen Klopp era. You know, we know that Jürgen had his issues at Borussia Dortmund, where, to Jason's point, found out a little bit 
and here he's been given the opportunity to evolve the football team we saw in that kind of final nine games of the season a, a tweak in formation they were going more to a back three Trent Alexander-Arnold given that kind of freedom a la dare I say at Man City Arsenal where your full backs are allowed to come in central areas of the football pitch and, and Trent had a real good end to that campaign defensively we still know he's got his frailties but on the ball set piece delivery delivery I only think Kevin De Bruyne is better than him in the, the Premier League so I'm intrigued by Liverpool I really am and, and to Ben's point you made earlier, you know, Declan Rice is going to be sold for 105 million. Jude Bellingham has gone for upwards of 110 million plus, all told, with all the add ons. You know, to get Sobis Lie and to get Alexis McAllister for nigh on 95 million, still an exorbitant sum, don't get me wrong. It's two for the price of one, isn't it? Exactly, Angus. It's two for the price of one. Their, their age, it, I think, counts into that. You know, you look at Sobis Lie's numbers over in Austria with Red Bull Salzburg, then in Germany with RB Leipzig. You know, good numbers, double assists, you know, double figures in assists, double figures in goals. He'll add a different string to the Liverpool bowl. And then Alexis McAllister, and Alexis McAllister just needs it all together. Two real good recruits. I'm with Ben, though. I think they need a destroyer. They need a third in there, a little bit more legs in there. And then I'm, mark my words, this Liverpool team, to Ben's question earlier, I think you're going to be looking for more than just top four. I think they will emerge out of the pack once again, genuinely, as Man City his biggest rivals. Whether they can last a 38-game season remains to be seen, but I think we will see a market improvement in Liverpool this upcoming campaign. I think as well, Angus, just going on the recruitment at Liverpool, I think you'd be far pushed to say maybe one or two, maybe Naby Keita you throw into that bracket where the manager hasn't used his skill set of developing the players to make them better. I mean, mm. what was the, who's the last superstar that Liverpool brought in? I don't He's made players superstars Mo Salah wasn't a superstar when he came to Liverpool. Neither was Allison. You know, neither was Fabinho. You know, to he, that point, G, G, sorry to jump in. Thiago well, Alcantara right. is probably the last kind of established star who they've brought. Well, that was in. over the box, wasn't it? That really yeah. didn't fit, like Ben said. That really didn't fit the business model of Liverpool. Mm. I was really surprised at a player coming in at that age. I think, I think he suited what Liverpool needed at that time. But he certainly went against the grain from a, from a business point of view. I, I was quite surprised Jürgen got it pushed over the line, to be honest. Yeah, I think the other thing I would say, which is intriguing, is for all of the change at Liverpool, including, of course, a new sporting director who's potentially only going to be in for this window, Liverpool have very much stuck to their model, even with FSG exploring investment opportunities, even with wholesale change, even with Julian Ward leaving the club, even with Michael Edwards before that, they've stuck to their model. Liverpool always seem to have a plan. And I think that people at the football club, like Barry Hunter, the chief scout, are very important to that yeah. because they make sure that everything ticks over. And whereas publicly it might be Liverpool panic, Liverpool losing ground, privately Liverpool are doing their thing. And even when they yeah. pulled out of Bellingham, sources would always indicate to me at the club they were calm about the situation. Why? Because they knew that Alexis McAllister and Soboslai were probably incoming, more so McAllister because Soboslai was kind of a whirlwind 48 hours, but they knew that they could do something. And I suppose my question to Jason, to Chris, and even you, Angus, is how important, therefore, do we think the first game is of the season, specifically for Liverpool? Because I look at it and I think, wow, not only is it a big game at Stamford Bridge, but it's something that for both Chelsea and for Liverpool can really set the tone. So usually we just say everyone wants to start the season well, but if you don't win that first game, as Manchester United showed last season, you can recover. But it just feels like it's the two clubs that need a push more than anything on that first game of the season at Stanford Bridge. And if one of them can go and win that first game convincingly, then it will set that team up for the entire season, which is why I think it's a really important game. Uh, it makes me like the first game of the season. There's so much on it, isn't it? It's like, I think because we've had such a wait for it and we, we just, we want it, don't we? And it, Usually the sun is shining and it's a glamorous game, isn't it? And what have you. I, I agree with you in some respects, Ben, of, you know, the, the teams, they need to hit the ground running and, and sort of put a footmark down and say, listen, we're here. You know, we're back. Both teams need to do that. And there is an element of that. But I wouldn't read too much into it being the first game of the season. It, it's there's so, there's so much euphoria about that first game. You, you can easily lose it. And 
I mean, just look at Arsenal. I mean, the start that they had two seasons ago and then all they almost get over the line and win the Premier League last season, didn't they? It was, you know, Arteta was out after five games, wasn't it? But then he, he got it together. They went on a 10-game unbeaten run and then the rest is what we're, we're looking at now. So I wouldn't read too much into it, but I'd say Chelsea probably, If to, to answer your question, if we want to talk about that first game, I think Chelsea need it a lot more than Liverpool. I think all eyes are on Chelsea rather than Liverpool. I think there's more expect, expectation of Liverpool you know, are not too far away where Chelsea, we just feel, we just don't know what we're getting with Chelsea. We just don't know who they are and, and, and what's happening there. Where Liverpool still has their identity. Liverpool still has, it's still Liverpool and it's still got the foundations are still there. Where you look at Chelsea and you just think, you know, for me, it's built on sand. It's like a sandcastle. You just, it could collapse at any moment. I think the thing about that fixture for me is that Liverpool have got it away from home. And they had such a poor record away from home last season, losing eight games. Yes, they lost some big ones, but they also lost some games that they really shouldn't have done. The likes of uh, Bournemouth away, uh, Wolves away, Forest away. Three games that if you're going to be contending for the title, you just cannot contemplate being beaten eight times on the road if you're going to get into the top two, let alone the top four. Um, that's, that's what Liverpool needs to sort out for me next season. Absolutely. Just going back to that, actually, just listening to Ben talking about the, the magnitude of that opening game. I think the intriguing aspect for me is we might be looking at two remodeled midfields, undoubtedly, but two of the best. You know, if, if Chelsea get the Moises Casado deal over the line, and I know Ben's obviously close to Chelsea Football Club, you know, Moises Casado, I, I know Graham Potter well. He had him at Brighton. Casado's the nearest thing, and this is a big statement I'm about to make, but he's the nearest thing to Angulo Kante as there is in world football. I think a midfield of Enzo Fernandez, who I know flattered to deceive a little bit his talent is there but Fernandez and Casado in that engine room for Chelsea Mauricio Pochettino will be licking his lips at that potential and then Sobislai and McAllister with perhaps one other in at Liverpool that is an intriguing battle yes okay we might be putting too much stock on an opening game of the fix, uh, opening game of the season but from a from a kind of spectacle standpoint so much intrigue around that kind of midfield battle between the two and you're absolutely right Angus Liverpool you know they've got to sort their away form and maybe with that new midfield that new look that remodeled midfield will give themselves a better chance to pick up more wins and more points away from home next season I just wonder Jason how much you can gamble on changing much of your midfield when when Jurgen Klopp uh, holds so much stock in his midfield and it is so vital to the way Liverpool play that if you're adding you know at two new players um, okay one of which has had seasons in the in the Premier League the other hasn't you know, you can't. Can you gamble on putting two new signings no. like that in he into won't. the? He won't. That's not how he does it, Angus. He, he, you know, I remember being away with him on pre-season tour last season. You know, we had a game in Thailand and a game in Singapore, and Nunes had just come in, and he worked and worked and worked with Nunes, and he just wasn't comfortable. He he, he actually couldn't do what they wanted him to do. And they, they tried, they, they were stopping sessions, they were asking him to press, you know. And he, But you, you've got to understand it from a player's point of view. He's just come from a completely different culture, completely different philosophy at a different football team. And then to drop him in and play like Liverpool play, which is, which is quite niche the way Liverpool play, the high pressing, but they all go, they all know their jobs, they play very high up the pitch. You know, they win the ball back in high percentage areas and they create a lot of chances and they score goals. That's that's That was Liverpool's model. But, you know, it's obviously changed as the season progressed because like we spoke about before, you know, Liverpool get them found out. But Jürgen Klopp is, is, is not a massive gambler when it comes to his, his, his new recruits. You know, very rarely does he throw them in from the very beginning. I mean, Darwin Nunes, you know, had to spend time out the team. I remember when, when Andy Robertson came, he, he got put in, couldn't do it got taken out the team, had to learn his role, you know, in practice matches. And then he got thrown back in. He gradually learned it. They all do. Cody Gapko was another one. You know, it happens to them all. So, Slobosliar, I, th I think, will take a bit of time. I think if you're saying to me, will he gamble on McAllister? I think, yeah, because of his experience in the Premier yeah. League. But he's a very clever player as well. I think he he will get it a lot quicker than, than maybe some of the other signings that we've had. Um, so, for that midfield... You know, if you're asking me now to put my hat on it, I'm going, I'm going for Chelsea away. I'm going Jordan Henderson, and I'm going Fabinho, and I'm going McAllister. That, yeah, I think I would agree with that. 
as well. And I think, look, on the midfield, just to add to Chris's point on Caicedo for those interested, Chelsea are pushing. There's not necessarily a direct rival yet, but there could still be a twist and it will be interesting to see what the price is. We're hearing at the Brighton and 100 plus million, but my understanding is that there's kind of a verbal agreement between Caicedo and Roberto De Zerbi that says he can go for a fair offer and the Caicedo camp made it clear before he signed a new deal after the whole January Ferrari where he nearly joined Arsenal, that fair deal is basically the chew many package. So that's about £70 million pounds plus add-ons. And as a consequence, I think that Chelsea or another suitor might be able to get a deal there. Arsenal are not looking at Caicedo at this point, but that could, of course, change if Granit Xhaka and Thomas Partey go. And then Manchester United were never realistically going to be able to come in for Moises Caicedo. But on the Liverpool front, They'd love Caicedo. Barry Hunter, the chief scout, to my knowledge, was looking at Caicedo before he joined Brighton, but it was a messy deal. He was at a club known as IDV and was represented by multiple agents. And there were all kinds of what's known in the industry as messy costs. So now the profile of Caicedo is perfect for Liverpool, but the cost isn't. So again, is that accurate, Ben? Sorry to cut you off. Is that an accurate valuation, 100 million? Like well, Brighton are going to be pushing for 100 million because they're going to be leveraging you, the, the Declan Rice package. I don't think it's an accurate valuation no. in my mind, but even 80 million is seen as too high from the perspective of the Caicedo camp. They want a move. So you'd think the agent would be pushing for as much money as possible because ultimately then that benefits those that are close to the deal. But they want to facilitate the move for Caicedo as they did in January. And they felt like in January it should have been 60 million. And now he's signed a new deal. The value's protected, but it obviously is going to be more than Arsenal were offering and Chelsea still hope that it will be less than 100 million. And somewhere in the middle of that will be between 75 and 85 million. And we have to see whether Chelsea or another suitor can get that deal done. But I was thinking, Jason, when you were outlining the midfield, I wonder if maybe we can get your thoughts on existing Liverpool players that are the senior ones that should be leading, should be performing, have that know-how of the football club. And there's maybe one or two like Virgil van Dijk or Henderson that are still quality players for Liverpool, but arguably are not quite at their peak or at least didn't perform to it last season. What from your experience as a player will go on during pre-season? Because there's that clear cut scenario where manager will say to a player, you're surplus to requirements. But then there's that grayer area where a player's still got everything, but maybe is just not performing to their level. How do you think Jurgen Klopp will handle that with players he wants, but just weren't at their best last season? To be honest, Ben, there's a lot more to, to footballers these days than, than just what they provide on the pitch. I mean, a manager's job has evolved, you know, over the, the last, well, certainly since I've played. Gone as the manager who's allowed now to get personal in a dressing room. You can't, you can't pick on a player now. You can't, you can't call a player out individually. It's got to be done. Criticism has got to be aimed in a dressing room now collectively because the players don't like it. They're straight on the phone to their agents and then it's a minefield then. Upsetting a footballer now is just a no-no. So you've got to handle them with care. <laughs> so it's, a, it's like TV Kagan presenters, they're all the rope. same. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to choose my words carefully. Here. I think Kagan <laughs> has, a, has a bit more rope in his dressing room because he's been there a while. The players know him personally, so they they know he doesn't, you know. And and Jurgen's very clever with it. You know, when you see Jurgen runs down the down the dressing room, uh, down the tunnel during the game at Anfield. He, he very much goes into his own dressing room, his own room. He's got his own private room where he collects his thoughts and he just battens down the temper. And then he'll go into the dressing room with a more level head and say the things he wants to say in a more constructive way, where back in the day, it was usually a, a, a size nine wrapped around your ear holes or a, or a tube <laughs> of deep heat coming your way at 100 mile an hour. But I think where, where a player now is worth his weight in gold, not just on the pitch, and I think this is where they've missed a the trick with James Milner, is the players get a lot more rope to say what they want to say to individuals. And I know Jordan Henderson will call out a player and get him on his own and call him out. And I know things are happening in the dressing room that would raise an eyebrow, but sometimes it, it, still, it still needs to be there. It still needs to be done. The young players still need a slap around the, the backside to, to put That's a raising, raising an eyebrow of a, a player on a player. 
Jason. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, you, you know, there still needs to be that calling out aspect. There still, it still needs to happen. But what I'm saying is, unfortunately, a manager can't do it. So he's now looking at his players in his dressing room who are going to do that for him. And I know James Milner and I know Jordan Henderson were them players. Maybe not so much Virgil van Dijk, but I know they they were his leaders in the dressing room. They were the ones who were getting players up by the scruff of the neck. I know I know a player has had a player up by the throat in the dressing room because he hasn't done what he's done and he's a little bit cocky and he thinks he's better than what he is. And he's been brought down to earth by a senior player grabbing a, another player and telling him where he's going wrong, but in a in an old fashioned way. And 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 it's, it's and that's still, still going on in the Liverpool dressing room. It still goes on in the Liverpool dressing room, and it's a good thing. It's a healthy thing. It's done in a. You could probably argue that that's not a healthy way, but you know, it's it's what's needed sometimes. And I'll tell you now, that player who I'm on about, I can't name names, but that player has gone on and had a, a great career at Anfield, and and he's still there, and he's probably playing some of his best football right now. And it, that is a learning curve that sometimes is needed. You know, sometimes you can't put your foot around, but a manager has to. He has to manage it in a different way now. So the likes of Jordan Henderson, yeah, he might not be performing. You know, I'm using this in a in an open way. He might not be performing, let's say, in a way we've expected of Jordan Henderson, but he's certainly adding value to that dressing room. And I feel James Milner is a big loss. I would have kept James Milner. One hundred percent would have kept him. I'll come back to that, Jason, because I, I just want to finish with Chris for a, for a moment because, Chris, you're, you're based in the Middle East. Yeah. Uh, Bobby Firmino is one who is going to, it looks like he's, uh, and as um, uh, Fabrizio was saying a little bit earlier, the deal is nearly done. I mean, he's nearly um, going to be in Saudi. What is the, what's the feeling of, certainly in that Middle East area, of, of what the Saudis are doing and, and uh, you know, how many big name players seem to be turning up in, in Riyadh or Jeddah in in the recent weeks? It's amazing, Angus. I think certainly from the people that I'm talking to, and I'm talking to a lot of agents who are setting up camp in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, I mean, they, they, they we're only scratching the surface. We're, we're going to see an awful lot more. I had one figure that was put to be 17 billion, that's billion pounds, has been ring-fenced for Saudi Pro League uh, from now until 2030. Of course, the Saudi 2030 vision, which is very much a point where they want to present Saudi. They feel that there'll be a point there they can present the kingdom to the rest of the world. 17 billion ring fenced for football alone. Uh, Bobby Firmino, yeah, as uh, Romano's rightly pointed out, he looks as if he'll be set to move there. The obvious links with Steven Gerrard today, confirmation or at least rumoured that he is back in talks with Aleti Fak and that a deal could be done in the next 24 to 48 hours for him to become manager of that football club. The obvious links there will be Philip Coutinho, of course, the man that Steven took to Aston Villa. There's another ex Liverpool link there. Uh, Thiago Alcantara, you know, we're talking about Liverpool's new, new remodelled midfield. Throw Harvey Ely into the mix. Curtis Jones, who had a good end to the campaign. Fabinho, Jordan Henderson. Thiago Alcantara might actually be the surplus to the requirement in that Liverpool midfield. He could be someone that we could see in Saudi Arabia. My understanding is a coterie of offers have gone out to players in Europe, to agents, and it's essentially stick your hand up if you fancy a move to Saudi Arabia. It won't be to the liking of all. You know, Saudi Arabia, for, for those viewers who perhaps aren't aware, very different from the United Arab Emirates in Dubai, where I'm based, you know, still very much looking to come online. Yes, they've got ambition plans. It's going to take time in terms of the infrastructure, what you can do away from the football pitch, but they're serious. And the market difference, I've seen a lot of comparisons with Saudi and China. The big difference is there is a footballing culture in Saudi Arabia. You know, the big clubs get sellout crowds and they are going gaga over this. They've got Ronnie, they've got Benzema, they've got Ngulu Kante and the expectation is there will be a raft of more big names heading to Saudi before the summer transfer window is out. Chris, yeah. Just to, just to touch on that, sorry, Angus. You know that we we've seen this obviously with China before, trying to attract players, and obviously you know through financial gain for the player. But is the sustainability of Saudi different model 
than what we see yeah. in China. Yeah. Yeah. To, to give you an idea, Jason, I mean, pay for the public investment fund, yeah. 750 billion. Is that the disposable Yasser al Ramati and the man who heads up that? Of course, he's been making headlines for Live Golf as well. He's yeah. obviously a part of the Newcastle United board as well. So, yeah, very, very different model. 17 billion. And I hate saying this, but it's a drop in the ocean for the power brokers in Saudi Arabia. They mean business. They wanted Messi. They were willing to pay it. You know, pay him upwards of close to a billion just for a three year stint with, of course, ambassadorial role attached to that, like Cristiano Ronaldo has signed. So, yeah, the big difference, Jace, is that the money is there. They'll continue to pour money into football. And it's very much here to stay with the kingdom of Saudi Arabia having ambitions of hosting the World Cup in 2030. I'm going to dust my boots down, Angus. I think there's still yeah, a chance. <laughs> well, I, I'm surprised you haven't been invited on the Live Tour yet either. <laughs> Seniors, I'm waiting for the live seniors. So that's what I'm waiting for. <laughs> Very good. We'll we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, Chris, thank you for your company. Um, it's been great to. Uh, we will come back to you over and over again as as Saudi Arabia grows um, in this this pro league, which uh, it seems exponential. And it's really yeah. interesting that you put those sorts of figures on it because yeah. 17 billion is is an awful lot. Just almost for starters, you feel like that that there is only one way that this is going to go afterwards. And the impact that they have had in such a short space of time. Yeah, and just very quickly, Angus, before I, I know I need to run, but I think uh, uh, something the news that perhaps will miss some people past, which I think is actually another key kind of cornerstone, if you will. We've seen in the last few days confirmation that Nike are taking on the kit manufacturers of Al Nasser. You know, they had a Saudi brand before that. We've seen Puma enter into uh, the Saudi league as well. That is another key building block. We've got, you know, global manufacturers now taking an interest and the next big step will be big TV broadcasters. And then after that, the world's their oyster because I go back to it. The football culture is there. There are going to be full stands. It's not like over here in the United Arab Emirates, large swathes of empty seats. Not so in the Saudi Pro League. It is full houses, big names, huge money. The Saudi Pro League is here to stay with the ambition, and I've heard this from a good source as well, being a top five global league by that 2030 date as well. So Liga mm. 1 in France, watch out, they're coming for you. Yeah, uh, some people in trouble. Uh, in other parts of Europe, are going to have to be looking over their shoulder. Chris, thanks very much indeed. Jason, do you feel that the, the Premier League should be concerned then with what's going on in Saudi? Um. My my take on it, Angus, is obviously the Super League, you know, came around. Um, and from what I'm led to believe, you know, that was Saudi Saudi money that was trying to to bring in the Super League. And obviously it went away or it's quietened down. Um, and I think Saudi have just turned around and went, right, well, we'll just create our own league and we'll just do it a different way. And it could be the start of that, to be honest. Um, I don't think it's going to go away. I think, I think there's room for everybody. I think, like the golf, I'm all for things expanding, all for, for movement. You know, I am a traditionalist. I, you know, I, I don't really like it, but I get it, and I understand things have to move on. We're living in a different world, and everything's getting bigger and better, and things are moving on. And you know, you've got to sometimes you've just got to go with it. Um, and they have got the financial package and the power. Uh, to do that so they're not going to go away and they're trying to develop and as long as they develop all aspects of everything that we talk about that comes with Saudi um, then you've got to give them the opportunity as long as they do it in the right way so the answer to your question should the Premier League I think what they need to do whereas we've seen with Liv I think Liv went up against them sorry with the with the PGA is Liv went up against or the PGA went up against Liv and it, it, there was only going to be one outcome, but it's how you go up against them. And I think what the what the Premier League will probably look at is they're not going to go away. How are we going to how are we going to work together? How are we going to all get on as friends and all have an equal playing field where we all benefit and we all get the best out of it? Ben, Rather you're than... dealing with yeah, Ben, you're dealing with agents all the time, uh, talking to them. Are they just turning their heads to Saudi and trying to get as much money for their players, or they, or, or the players are saying, well, at the moment, those in the right part of their career, they're going to carry on in the Premier League, 
and maybe it's something they look at in the future. Well, agents are in a slightly odd position in all of this because actually the Saudi deal makers have got their own agents that look across the league at large. So it's a little bit atypical because actually the agent acting on behalf of the Saudi deal makers is effectively going to clubs and treating them like they're a supermarket and saying, how many players can we get? And then where can we send them? So the player agent comes in a little bit later down the line and various agents will contact me and say, who's doing all of these Saudi deals? So we might actually find that the player agents are not the ones driving the move so much as the Saudi deal makers going to the clubs and trying to shop in bulk and then bringing in the appropriate agents. And this is the same even with the club officials who come in a lot later in the deal. First, it's done between club or potentially player and Saudi deal makers. And then the actual officials on behalf of the club come in a little bit later. For example, I can tell you as we're speaking, Jota at Celtic is about to go to Saudi Arabia and join Al Ittihad, and he's currently in the UAE where he will meet with the club officials before eventually flying over to Saudi Arabia in the current days that follow and likely Celtic are going to get something in the region of 25 million for that deal. Mm -hmm. Also, whilst I'm speaking, Marcelo Brozovic has just been announced at Al Nasser and that's a deal worth about 18 million euros. And again, this is very much about the deal makers in that case, eventually finding a fee with Inter, but the agents are in a slightly unique position and I think everyone's learning. And what I sort of wanted to say before we come back to Liverpool is just that, the Saudi model is gambling upon young audiences and players being the commodities. So we're familiar with football as teams and brands. And for many years, we've been thinking about how can we bring Manchester United or Chelsea or Liverpool global? And there's a real desire historically for those to be the teams that travel all over the world. And Jason will have been a part of that in pre-season or exhibition matches. But now there's this real feeling that if you get a Ronaldo, if you get a Messi, yeah. and maybe there's 20 other players in the world, if they move clubs, then a loyal fan base follows yeah. them, which means that whether they move to a brand new club, an unknown club, a very fervently followed club in Saudi Arabia, but not with as much global appeal, or whether they stay where they are, the fan base are quite prepared to stay loyal to that player. So if you get enough of those players in Saudi Arabia, perhaps the clubs they play for won't matter because the audience comes from that loyalty to the individual players. And that's the change for me. Whereas I think 20 years ago, if a big name player left Liverpool for Saudi Arabia, the people that were wowed by that player would have said, who's next for Liverpool? Now they're saying, we'll go on the journey with the player wherever they go next. Mm. Absolutely. I, I totally agree with what you just said there, Ben. And I think that factors into going back to Liverpool was the Mo Salah deal. I think Liverpool knew that, you know, as, as big as Liverpool are as a brand, you know, Mo Salah brings his own following, certainly from the part of the world he's from, the Muslim culture and, you know, the, the, the fan base that he has. They're not necessarily Liverpool fans. They're Mo Salah fans. And if he was to leave the football club, then a big chunk of their following would go with him. I, I totally agree with you, Ben. Absolutely. That's the way it's gone now, or it's going certainly that way. Um, just want to ask you quickly, Ben, on, you know, the, the, the regulations, are they under a different umbrella, the Saudi league, to what the Premier League would be or Serie A? No, not at all. And I think that's what's interesting, that the Super League was about a rogue model, whereas the Saudi yeah. League falls under the FIFA rules. So yeah. if we look historically, and we should point this out, then actually FIFA and FIFA Pro in particular, who represent the players, have had big problems with Saudi Arabia because we have a history of players going over there and then getting into wage disputes. So when yeah. people sort of speak about the sports washing angle or the concerns, that's the point that's being made, that we're getting excited about new models money and big name players but there's actually a historical problem when they've also paid players well to come over there and they haven't had such an enjoyable experience so we need to look at it at both sides but I think the reason why this won't be a threat is because it falls within the FIFA family and from FIFA's point of view I don't think they could care less how we rank the leagues it's almost a bit complacent of Europe's five leagues to just say we're the biggest we're the best 
and anything else is a threat because within those five, four of them are not particularly happy about the Premier League. And I don't even know if we can call it Europe's big five leagues or the biggest five yeah. leagues in the world. I think that we call it the Premier League. And then as we saw with the drive towards the Super League, leagues and clubs feel threatened by the Premier League. So this is just the reality of how football is moving. And as long as it's within the FIFA family and with an expanded Club World Cup that will allow lots of new clubs to be on the world stage, I think that Gianni Infantino will be licking his lips, whether rightly or wrongly, by Saudi Arabia trying to disrupt what we've always considered to be five big European leagues. If I can go back, though, um, Jason, to you, let, let, let's go back to finish where we started with Liverpool. And that has been the basis of our conversation today. How long do you think for Jurgen Klopp? I know we've had conversations in the past that maybe one day Jurgen will just hang up his, his boots and just want to go off fishing and have a quiet life. And he's done, is it eight years now? Nearly eight years at Liverpool, yeah. which is probably longer than he may have anticipated. He's having to rebuild Liverpool somewhat this year. Uh, it may be a small rebuild, but it is a rebuild because after a disappointing season. And I wonder how much longer, I'm not trying to get rid of him or anything, but how realistically he might stay at Liverpool. Um, and this may be the last time he reinvents a side. It's a difficult question to answer because of the nature of the beast. I mean, a manager's job now is, I mean, we keep going back. It, it's so much different and the demands on them now from a stress point of view from a you know from the fact that they have to win and there's, there's got to be a return it, it, it's just monotonous you just don't get away from it and going back to spending time you know with the first team it, it, it's literally full on you know it, it, it pre-season we you know they go into a they're going into Asia again actually into Singapore he'll have his training camp they've got to meet commercial responsibilities I know that drives him mad but it drives most managers mad because they hate going that far there's a time difference. It's all got to be catered for. They stay on English time as long as they can. And it mm. just becomes very difficult. And it's all, it just all adds to the stress of, of, of winning football matches and preparation and everything. So, you know, he's dealt with it really, really well over them seven or eight years. But there is going to be a, a point where, you know, I just think it's going to be too much for him. Um, as with every manager, I think the longevity in the game is... You know, he's probably succeeded in the fact that we didn't think managers would go that long anymore. We we all thought the Ferguson, the Wenger kind of managers was 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 a thing of the past, but he's kind of surpassed that, hasn't he, with with his time scale? And I just don't know how long he's got left. I think he feels he doesn't want to go on, you know, a downward spiral. I think he would like to leave on a more upward spiral, putting him in a good place if he was to turn around and go maybe in a couple of seasons. Listen, I've done all I can here. I've left you in a very healthy position, whether that's Champions League or he's put another couple of trophies in the cabinet and he just goes, thanks, uh, and hands it down. What I'd like to see is, and I'm sure it's been spoken about, is how the club's going to be left when he does go and whether that's you know getting someone in now who takes over seamlessly, like we've seen at Anfield for years and years and years. It was always a natural progression whether it was through Paisley or Shankly Paisley into Fagan, into Daglish, into Evans or Sooness and Evans. Sooness never quite worked out, but Evans, you know, I would like to see that done. Um, you know, who, whoever that may be. I don't know. Maybe bringing a Steven Gerrard in to, to see the ropes. Xabi Alonso maybe would be a nice one, but they've all, you know, that's down to them, isn't it? But I'd like to see it all just carry on because I think the club, the way it's run is fantastic. I think it's fantastic. It's it's a it's a very successful business model. Ben, your thoughts for for Liverpool this this season and and what we expect from Jurgen Klopp and his squad. Well, I think we'll see a bit of stability. I think we'll see a lot more consistency of performances. It's fine margins with Liverpool. The midfield has been an area that fans in particular have been screaming to revamp for at least the last two windows, and it looks like they've succeeded there. And the big thing for me as well that maybe we haven't mentioned is going to be the front line. And it's very easy to talk about Mo Salah in the context of Salah, Firmino and Mane. And now Firmino's not there, but also had diminished game time last season. And obviously Sadio Mane had left as well. And it's not just about those three and their 
chemistry and near innate understanding. It's the fact that Salah and Nunez in particular is a very intriguing partnership. And what we saw last season is Salah being a little bit wider and not as involved. And I think that even a bad season for Mo Salah still tends to have 15 goals. And he took his time to get started and actually had a tremendous, in my opinion, second half to the season, but wasn't still quite as clinical as he has been in seasons gone by. And that, again, is because he has to develop an understanding and not just play as Mo Salah, but work out how Liverpool can have a cohesive front line and that will also come with a midfield that's a bit more tenacious that wins a lot more second balls that has progressive passes and also alleviates the burden so that's going to be quite interesting to see how Salah can become not only the main goal scorer potentially but the focal point and at the same time Nunez has to try and become the main goal scorer and the focal point and Gakpo is only going to get better as well so there's a lot to like because some of the Liverpool players that maybe didn't set the world on fire and particularly Gapo, when you look at the World Cup that he had and Nunez coming in with a big reputation at the same time as Erling Haaland, these could be the players that in their second Premier League season start to really click and set the world on fire. So Liverpool have got weapons perhaps that are already at the football club rather than only needing to move in the market. Then behind the scenes, I still think that we're going to see something move at some point during the season on the investment side with FSG. It won't be a full sale, but they are still exploring the possibility of minority investment. And one wonders after the Manchester United saga ends whether we're actually going to see that as a yardstick for price and then FSG try and move in some capacity. So there's lots to like at Liverpool because despite the disappointment of last season, I still feel that behind the scenes when I talk to sources, there's calmness and stability and as long as that's there and there's a plan then Liverpool will be back where they belong sooner rather than later but realistically finally Jason second is you where you're anticipating them uh, at best I seen at Manchester City because it was a joy to work on the games it frightens me <laughs> <laughs> um, the second half of the season, I just thought Pep, it was fascinating watching him trying to figure out how to create a balance with Haaland and the rest of the team because the cohesion wasn't quite there in the first half of the season. And I think it's just given him a headache, a puzzle that he was desperate to work out. I think, you know, moving the likes of, or trialing Rico Lewis in a different position in midfield, going to a back three at times, I think it, it opened his eyes up, but then he realised that John Stones might have been the better option in that position. And he turned John Stones into, well, he, he played like Beckenbauer at times, didn't he? Uh, I'm sorry for the beeping. Someone's either robbing my house or <laughs> I'm about to come in. <laughs> um, but I, 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 I look at Manchester City and I just think, apart from complacency, which could hinder them, I can't see that because of the manager. He, he, that's his job is to keep the hunger and desire. And he's, you know, he, he's as good as we've ever seen a keeping a team do that as much as Alex Ferguson was a master of it. So was Pep. And I can see Manchester City actually going and beating. I, I can't. Can They're that good. They are that good. I mean, that 45 minutes against, all right, we can argue Real Madrid, you know, an aging midfield and this, that and the other. It was still a phenomenal 45 minutes. And to get over the line, as I've seen with Liverpool, 63 games, you know, it takes the toll. There's a reason why a team hasn't done the quadruple. But I think Manchester City are geared up to actually do it next season. And I think Pep will get it between his teeth and he'll be desperate to do it. And then we might see Pep bow out after he's done that. But next season, I think we're going up against one of the greatest teams that we've probably seen in the Premier League. And for Liverpool... It's a daunting prospect to think that they can finish above them because any team that does is going to win the Premier League. Uh, you need to go and find an electrician. Um, so, so <laughs> sorry, <laughs> or, or someone, yeah, who's yeah, currently in your room. bedroom. <laughs> to be honest, mate, you won't find any medals because, as you know, I didn't win any, so he's in the wrong no. house. <laughs> you got a runners up medal. You might have yeah, gone I for did, that one. Yeah, my mum's got that. <laughs> you, you might throw that at you. Uh, Jason, thank you very much indeed for Thanks. joining. Great it's been to great see to you, have man. your company. Great to see you.
That is your football debrief. Our thanks to Chris McCarty, who joined us earlier as well. And as always, our thanks to Fabrizio Romano for dropping in. Remember, he'll be here every week giving us his spin on all the big transfer dealings around the world. You can find us on Fab Substack, on YouTube, and all your usual podcast platforms. Ben, thanks for your company once again. Look forward to next week. Indeed. Thanks for listening, everyone. If you want your football talking points discussed, you'll find we do that every week with the game's opinion makers. We'll see you next week.